Hello and welcome back to Real Estate Live UK and our second week of virtual events which is brought to you by White Label, our partners and sponsors. Um, we hope you've been enjoying the week of events so far and um, we're looking forward to our next session which is brought to you by Capital West London in partnership with WFP. Um, we've got a really fantastic panel today and we're hoping that you're going to be engaging with them and asking lots of questions during the session and to kickstart your engagement um, we're going to be launching a quick poll which we've been launching at the beginning of each of our sessions this week. Um, and it's actually a similar question to one we asked in June, um, which is asking you, what do you think the most important factor in unlocking development and ensuring the continued strength of UK real estate is? Um, there's quite a few different options, some of them relevant to this panel, some to others during the week. So depending on what you've been listening to, it may impact your answer. But um, I'll give you a couple of minutes to pick your selection and we'll be sharing the results of that poll um, and the comparisons with the June event at the end of this week. Um, during this session, please continue to interact and talk to us, um, mainly talk to our panel and to our chair. You can do that through the Q&A feature on Zoom, which is at the bottom of your screen. Um, please make sure you put all your questions in there and then um, Paul Norman, who's chairing this session, will aim to come to as many of them as possible. Um, but we can always do follow-ups afterwards with our speakers too, so um, feel free to message us if you'd like anything else answered. Um, we've got some really great speakers joining us for this session, as I mentioned, and without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Paul Norman, who's going to be chairing us um, for this debate on future mobility. Over to Paul. Oh, hi, all. Um, I was just about to vote there, and I noticed that hosts and panellists cannot vote. So, uh, oh, well, well, there we are. Uh, but uh, looking forward to seeing how that goes. Um, yeah, hi, I'm the editor of Coastal News, uh, the UK's most read commercial property news service, Paul Norman, and um, I'm here with a kind of brief to look at uh, future mobility, particularly in West London, but you know, to talk about this topic. Uh, the brief is how we work, learn, play, shop and stay healthy has radically shifted, uh, largely to the digitization of many of our day-to-day -day activities. What does this mean for our future mobility? And how can it adapt to changes in future customer needs, utilization, accessibility, and decarbonisation. What is the future for mass transportation? How will this impact business operations and people, logistics, and workflow? Um, I would say uh, that's a vast topic, uh, which touches us all in multiple ways. Uh, so not not just uh, in my with my real estate hat on, obviously. But um, we, it, we fortunately we've got a great panel here to discuss these these uh, particular opportunities in the topic. But with West London as as a kind of test bed for that. Um, the way it will work is I, I'm going to kind of pass over to each of the members of the panel first to talk for a few minutes each on um, this topic and how it sort of uh, works for them and what they've been doing as a company and what they think about some of the issues. Um, then um, I will then begin a 30 minute or so Q&A with them, at which I will um, also sort of open that up to questions from the audience. So please do uh, start sending them in and I'll see them flash up. Um, uh, but um, so we don't sort of waste any chance to um, for you to uh, you know, get involved in that. I'll, I'll firstly go to uh, Toby Thornton, who's the technical director of WSP, to ask um, Toby about um, you know what WSP has doing, been doing in the future mobility space and what they see as the key focuses moving forward, particularly with the uh, you know elephant in the room, COVID nineteen, um, having impacted so much recently. Thanks, Paul, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me. Uh, as, as Paul said, so I'm a technical director and, and private sector lead for future mobility at WSP. Uh, so very happy to be here alongside the, the brilliant panel, panel that we have. Um, a bit about WSP, we, we, we have a long standing interest in West London. We work on a wide range of public and private sector projects, and, and I've been fortunate to work on things, schemes like Earls Court. Um, and we're involved in a number of strategic development sites, new transport infrastructure that's both being built out now, but over the next 15 years or so. So embedding future mobility thinking is, is key to solving today's problems and, and the future success of, of these schemes. Uh, so, so it makes sense, I think, to start with a definition of future mobility. Uh, and, and quite simply for me, that is um, everything that's changing away from the norm within transport. Uh, so that encompasses the societal trends, uh, the behaviour change for where and how we work, live and play. Um, 
but it also extends to decarbonisation, to new modes, to new business models, um, data and connectivity, and uh, some of the excitement around automation and what that might mean. But our, our narrative is really on, on, on future mobility being centred on user needs, uh, being centred on understanding commercially viable business models, and needing to solve place-specific challenges. Um, so it's so much more than technology. It's inherently about people and places and access to opportunities. Um, uh, we've all had to endure the challenges brought by COVID-19. Uh, so whether that's health, well-being, economic or, or social challenges. Uh, in West London, this runs across a number of business sectors. Uh, the almost disappearance of, of Heathrow as an international hub for employment. Uh, but also the, how that disproportionate social impact is received by a diverse set of residents and workers across the region. I think where we all stand today is that we probably have a little bit more empathy across the different set of challenges. Uh, and for those that haven't digested it, I, I would recommend the, the Build and Recover Plan from the West London Alliance, which concisely sets out the, the scale of challenge facing West London. I think, I think the paradox of mobility brought by the pandemic is that um, clearly, we've shifted to remote and digital forms of working and consumption where possible uh, uh, and where we can. Uh, there's, there's been that renewed focus on active travel and walking and cycling. But on the flip side, we have had direct messaging, avoiding use of public transport, um, reducing confidence in taking public transport and shared mobility. And, and there has been a resultant growth in, in private vehicle traffic. There's also a more subtle you know, uplift in, in delivery traffic at the household level um, in the logistics market. So I think this all has forced us to consider our vision, what we want from mobility. Uh, within my vision, I think there's three key future mobility opportunities that I think are relevant to West London. The first is a form of a future mobility zone. So a part of the immediate green recovery response and, and recognising the Department for Transport's uh, decarbonising transport plan, but also taking inspiration from the future mobility zones that are underway across the UK. This is about creating a space to validate new mobility business models such as mobility as service and last mile freight, test new technologies such as 5G, but with the absolute aim of solving real problems and not just getting excited on the tech. So how do we get people back into workplaces? How do we enable a decarbonized freight network? Um, and that type of ecosystem investment could create jobs. It should increase the potential value of development in these locations. And, and linked to that, and the second point is around a mobility hub strategy. So recognizing that COVID-19 is not the end of cities, but it's, it's the rise of the neighborhood center. Uh, so how do hubs offer transport choice, but they also provide access to key services, whether it's parcel lockers, co-working space, crash, um, medical facilities, and they all support that 15 minute neighbourhood principle. And this could link in with key infrastructure like West London Orbital um, and, and align with the delivery of, of new homes in the region. So my final uh, point is, is really about the need to engage and learn from the innovators, the entrepreneurs, the key players leading on mobility in West London. Uh, just having, I think, West London's home to the likes of Arrival, who, if you haven't seen, are doing interesting things, redesigning the future of bus, uh, bringing forward electric van propositions, UPS ordering 10,000 vehicles from them. Another startup, Magway, they're, they're doing innovative pipeline logistics, which they're you know, globally selling that, that IP and that expertise. So I think the future mobility opportunity needs to be uh, human centric. It needs to focus on the green recovery, but uh, ultimately it's that, that collaboration piece. And I did have first-hand experience of, of some of Hounslow's COVID-19 innovation labs. So um, yeah, looking forward to hearing more from Niall later on. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Well, um, now to Lucette Demetz, who's head of Urban and uh, London and Partners, um, and just ask how London as a whole is adapting to consider this issue, uh, broadening out from West London, uh, and how important as well, we would be interested to know, sustainability is in all this, how much is it being uh, thought about, um, among other things, so just to ask you about that, Lucette. 
Yeah, thank you, Paul, and thank you to um, Capital West London for WSP for inviting me today. As Paul mentioned, I'm the Head of Urban Innovation for London and Partners. Um, for those of you who don't know us, we are the International Trade, Investment and Promotion Agency for London. So a lot of our work is around inbound investment and promotion of London internationally. So I wanted to, to kind of cover three things in, in my opening remarks. Um, so firstly, a little bit around where the city was aiming to get to you know, pre-COVID. Secondly, kind of what the impact of COVID has been on some of those objectives and visions. Uh, and then some key kind of closing points around maybe trends that we might see moving forward. All the while being conscious that we are still very much in the midst of responding to an ongoing pandemic and an ongoing situation. So some of the long term impacts is, of course, not yet uh, fully known. So in the pre COVID era, um, London, of course, had a very major focus on active travel and public transport, which is very much reflected in the mayor's transport strategy. I think the key stat that I usually talk about is that the vision is for 80% of travel to be either public transport or active travel, so walking and cycling by 2041. So there was a clear move away from private car usage, particularly in the central areas of London, focused on the healthy streets approach. Um, and it's it is an, a, you know, an impressive ambition. Uh, it also obviously clearly underpinned by, by sustainability as well. What we've of course seen with COVID is I think two main things. So a massive impact on public transit. Of course, overnight we went from encouraging all people to use public transport to basically stopping everyone to use public transit, which was the right decision at the time when it was taken because of the pandemic and needing to hold the spread. But of course, that has also had an impact on, on people's behavior. And of course, we now have the fear in terms of returning to public transit uh, because of the risk of uh, transmission of the virus. So ridership on public transit has to some extent come back, but it's of course still far below pre-COVID levels. I think we're, we're up to about a third on the underground and around 60% on, on buses. Mm. Um, and you know that of course implies that people are using other modes car being one and of course London is very much trying to avoid a car based recovery which would be hugely detrimental to, to the city but also to people's enjoyment of the spaces that they live and work and, and reside in. Um, the other thing I think that we've seen or the other two things I'd see is a massive acceleration of active travel. So there's been huge upticks in, in walking and cycling. Uh, I think to the extent that if you want to buy a bicycle, you're probably on a long waiting list uh, if yeah, you haven't got one right there. Uh, but also a uh, you know, massive response from government in terms of funding for um, cycling infrastructure, the launch of the street space program by the mayor of London, freeing up a lot of road space for walking and cycling, temporary or permanent. Uh, which is can only be you know commended and is a great I think evolution and of course very much linked into that concept of the 15 minute city which Toby already referred to. So and then the second part I think is a, a shift as well in terms of attitude towards other forms of micro mobility. Uh, we've of course seen the very rapid uh, consultation from the Department of Transport on e-scooters with some trials already being rolled out across the UK uh, and very much a shift in terms of the role that those additional forms can play in the broader mobility ecosystem. Uh, as we know, consultation are still ongoing in London and uh, we have a complex uh, government landscape to, to go through, um, but hopefully we'll see some outcomes of that in the not too distant future. Um, so I think then in closing to, to those sort of impacts, what does that mean kind of post COVID? If we, you know, hopefully we will get there at some point in the not too distant future. I think yes. it's, it's still sort of hard to assess, you know, how cities will fully come out of that and whether we go towards more polycentricity. But I think, I don't think yeah, that this is the end of cities, as Toby already alluded. Um, but three, three, thing, three key things, I think, to consider. Um, one is, and I'm going to quote a, a title of a webinar I recently attended, which was entitled, Public Transit is Dead, Long Live Public Transit. Uh, for me, that really sums it up because public transit is hugely affected uh, by the pandemic. But in the long run, I think the consensus is that uh, any urban or, or at least uh, densely populated environment has no other alternative to public transit that could provide the same level of efficiency, the same level of sustainability, the same level of accessibility, and also taking into account uh, equity. So we do have to bear in mind that 
a lot of people who are perhaps vulnerable or less well off are more extensively impacted by a decline in public transit uh, than some other parts of the society. So I think that's a key aspect to take into account. Mm. Secondly, of course, is that there's a number of other issues, and I think Toby's already mentioned some of them, you know, climate change, uh, congestion, air pollution, none of those issues have gone away. And in, in some sense, public transit is still the answer to, to those challenges. There is only limited road capacity. So even with technologies such as autonomous vehicles, um, we still have a limit on, on the physical infrastructure and space. And I think the third part is, is uh, the fact that the crisis has given us this moment in time to reflect on how we use our city and how we move around our city. And I think a key part of that is going to be around better multimodal integration, um, making it easier for people to make the right choices and the sustainable choices around what they use. And that will no doubt require better public-private collaboration. So I think I foresee an acceleration in better public-private collaboration for, um, for the mobility as a whole moving forward, um, because I think that's going to be essential. And I'll we'll leave it there. Mindful that's of a, the time. A, good, uh, a good one to move in, better public-private uh, you know, partnership. Good, good way to move into talking to Niall now, who, Niall Bolger, who's the Chief Executive of the London Borough of Hounslow. And uh, just, uh, no, I'll just ask you, you know, what changes have taken place over recent years in Hounslow as people shift more to ta technology and how has this impacted how people are getting around the borough and how in turn has that affected the, the council's plans on transport and infrastructure? Um, and it will, finally, I guess just, I mean, we'll come back to this, but how has COVID been accelerating change or forcing new new things to happen? Well, thank you very much for that introduction. I, I think Toby and Lisa could cover that. A range of issues. And I think I'd start off with thinking about where we are socially, economically, and then the consequential implications for our infrastructure and the future shape and design of our city. So, some facts for you. Toby's mentioned our Build and Recover Plan as the West London Alliance, which was published recently. But to give you a sense of the size and scale of what we're the challenge looks like post-COVID. So prior to COVID, uh, the West London subregion represent 4% of, of GBA, uh, UK GBA. And we also uh, had a, a, an economy which was the equivalent, which was bigger actually than Birmingham, Leeds and Glasgow combined. And that represents £74 billion pounds worth of GBA for the national economy. To give you a scale, indication of the scale of the impact of COVID-19 on our sub-region, which is very dependent on trade, and the proximity of Heathrow, obviously, is a key indicator for us about what we've, that feels like. And now come to the, the exam question about mobility then in a moment. But <laughs> give you a sense of uh, the issue about what we're dealing with. There are 280,000 residents currently furloughed in the West London sub-region, mm -hmm. and 71,000 people have applied for a universal credit, i.e. they are in economic difficulty since the start of the pandemic. That represents over a quarter of all claimants in the capital. So I need to frame our conversation in that context because there are massive social and economic implications as a result of COVID, which is dramatically impacting on our strategies for the future, not least in transport and mobility. So we are in the middle of this and we obviously are having a second wave of COVID impact at the moment. But that hasn't lessened our, uh, our ambition for our, our, our part of London, in fact, indeed, for our contribution to the UK economy. So as Toby and this set have indicated, there's real and profound implications for how we connect people and places and uh, stimulate economic development within our communities which profoundly impacts on our overall plan for the future in relation to transport and mobility. Uh, arguably, some of the uh, impacts we're seeing at the moment, for example, in terms of people re working remotely, uh, looking at uh, use of technology more, including my own organisation, there's approximately 2,000 people who've been working remotely for seven months with no discernible reduction in performance. Uh, uh, gives us a real challenge in relation to thinking about what we do around infrastructure. 
but also we've also escalated and uh, uh, and and speed uh, sped up some of the impact uh, uh, some of the objectives of the mayor's transport strategy. For example, for livable neighbourhoods, with no some in some some instances quite controversially, we're also looking at rethinking what we think about twenty first century mobility. And as Toby's indicated, in my own borough, we've been doing a lot of work in looking at innovation in urban management as part of our recovery planning. So some of the key object objectives we have for that are about looking at 21st century mobility as something which is an urban management issue rather than simply an infrastructure issue. How do you create spaces and places where people can move around? How do we embrace the concept of the 15 minute city? How do we ensure the hierarchy of mobility works within neighborhoods? How do we get social and economic connectivity closer to where people live? And how do we really think about the polycentric city that Lucette talked about as a reality for us as a global city going forward and coming up with ideas about innovating in that space so that we're embracing the techn technological advances that are coming out of mobility thinking that some of my panelists will talk about in a moment. Uh, obviously, there's been some positive benefits of the reduction in use of transport over, during the peak of the pandemic. In Hanzo, there was an 18% reduction in nitrogen oxide emissions measured as a consequence of that uh, lockdown. How do we capture those environmental benefits, which are also evident and emerging from the Mayor's Transport Strategy, in order that we can build back better is a key question for us as well. The, the, the other area, which I think Toby's already mentioned, is how do we demonstrate this? How do we demonstrate these new technologies? And we want to work with Heathrow Airport in particular about looking at an active travel demonstrator so that we can really identify what are the barriers and what are the solutions to 21st century mobility in a specific area in order that we can shift away from possibly having to rely on long planned for heavy infrastructure and respond more in the real time to people's mobility needs whilst also securing the benefits that we've already talked about about health environment and social connectivity as well as embracing technology so besides the fact that we're dealing with a really significant impact and shock to our social and economic system at the moment in London there are opportunities for us to reimagine the city in a different way, which puts people first, as Lucette indicated, about really rethinking how the city functions for communities and people, and that we can embrace technology to make a difference to their lives. Okay, thank you very much. Well, we'll come back to, to so a lot of that. Um, we're moving on to John Diamond, uh, finally, our, our panelist uh, director at PwC, and just ask, John, what's PwC um, seeing and advising its clients in terms of how companies are adapting to more staff working virtually? What, what's PwC doing, I guess? And um, how do you think it's going to employ, impact employee mobility in the future, I guess? Yeah, thank you, Paul. Um, uh, so uh, several months now, I've supported clients with, with the whole question of what are you doing during this crisis? What does it do to your plans, both for your for your office space, but also for 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 changes that were already underway with reference to how we think about the workforce and the work that people are delivering anyway? COVID, in that sense, has been a great a great accelerator. Actually, the question of what are we doing with our with our real estate and our space wasn't at the very top end of of the priority order as as, as clients were working through the the problem. Actually. Um, I was I was uh, yeah, pleased to see that the focus in the first instance for most organisations was around the employee, the workforce, well-being. Yeah. Yeah. Um, very quickly, questions started to arise around, well, how do we use technology? Can I enable people to work from home? Can I take tech that's on-site and on-premise and start to shift out into the cloud? Um, how do we think about the way that we work, the times that we work, how we deliver it, what our people are there to do, um, and, and how can we look to flex and shift and change that model and accelerate some old plans in some places and then some, some other places. This was um, organisations discovering that actually we can do things in a way that we couldn't before. We want to start to capture that and bottle that magic 
as we began to reopen um, our office office space and as the lockdown began to ease, so back as we hit the summer, then obviously we, we had a, a lots and lots and lots of questions about how do we get how do we get locations open so that they're safe, secure, and we can demonstrate to, to employees that, that that the workplace is a good place to be. That 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 subject is obviously still on the table. The 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 workplace piece and the real estate piece um, at the moment, for many, isn't resolved. Leaving aside, you know, length of, of leasing contracts, etc. I think most organisations are still getting their head into the space of actually, what do I want to do with my workforce? How will we work? And then we'll move to to location strategy. Yeah. But for us as a for us as a as a firm, I think that the way the way that we we look at this topic is that is that you know offices are essential for us. Um, you know, they're important for, for the well-being of our staff. And I think something people won't always realise about a firm like ours is that the average age of our workforce is 31. That's skewed by, by some uh, you know, very important old people. <laughs> but the median age is, is around 25, 26. So we are quite a young organisation and our young people in particular are keen to, to have office locations. They might want to reconfigure slightly how the space is used and what gets done in that office. But it's it's absolutely fundamental for for us, uh, a place for well-being, learning, but also our connection to the community and our local economy is is important. So we think we're going to have a blend of office and home working in the future. Um, before the prime minister's announcement that offices can be open for you know personal or business need, but avoid if you can, we had around eight thousand of our twenty-two thousand people coming into our office this is up from from a couple of hundred at the beginning of july yeah um, figures now kind of faded away slightly we have 40 percent fewer people um in our in our, in our offices um, than we did before and a, a lot of what's dictating our approach is actually what our workforce are saying they want and need um and we're taking to a significant degree an employee-led view of of um of the office space that we need and how we're going to we're going to use it we're expecting this hybrid of working in office on client sites and, and home working will be the norm we expect the majority of our people to be to be in and out more flexibly during during the week um but we definitely need the 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 um office space it, um uh, but the blend has a benefit for us um, I guess one of the key key questions just to ask, just to pick up very quickly for people will be in real estate will be, you know, our staff needing more space. Does it mean you're going to need less or, or equally perversely more space to uh, for staff um, in case in terms of your real estate portfolio? Or is it too early really to know? To yeah, know? I, I, think, I think it's too early to know for sure. When I, when I talk to our real estate team, um, you know, they, 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 I think what they're seeing is, is, to a degree, these things may begin to net off. So we are seeing some organisations saying, saying, well, we are looking to dramatically reduce that, 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 that footprint. Typically, though, when, when you look at that with a little more detail, um, the need for office space increases as people realise just how much you have to get done in the office that you really can't replicate if you're working, if you're working virtually. And on the flip side, I'm talking with more and more clients who are talking about needing to expand the space, do more in it, um, or indeed change uh, their model so that you so that you do run more hubs or you have more office space. It's just not necessarily quite so centralised. Yeah, in one place. Okay, okay. Uh, well, that's really interesting too. Thank you so much for that. So now it's time to kind of ask a few questions of the the panel um, and. As I've said before, you can very happily uh, send some in as well. Um, I, I, I will see them pop up. Um, I haven't seen any yet, so don't be shy uh, at all. Um, but first uh, question I think was around, I mean, such a huge topic, already picked up on loads and loads of things that are really quite complex. Um, is future mobility, this terminology, uh, an overriding concept that you know can be transported across the place? Or will it need to be adapted dependent on the specific area? And obviously, we're talking about West London here. I mean, and I guess within that, the question is, how much does government centrally need to be coordinating all of this? Um, and I, I guess I'd come to Niall first. Uh, obviously, you're you know, right at the coalface of this in terms of local local authority politics. So, um, 
The question of government intervention in, in local issues obviously is one of controversy. Um, I do think, though, we had the Prime Minister's speech yesterday give an in indication of glimmer of hope around building back better, and this phrases that will be used by him are very much about uh, rethinking what we need to do in relation to uh, how our city in London functions. So uh, talking about our overall recovery plan, we recognise that. We need to think about that very carefully uh, uh, in the context of how neighbourhoods function and how we take a more person-centred approach to all things, really. So mobility is part of that. But the need for social connectedness is something which we've also learned is really important. That green spaces are really well functioning. The places between buildings in terms of urban design are really important. How people connect with each other and how they do active travel. And also thinking about the hierarchy of transport requirements. And absolutely, we need to be, think beyond COVID-19 because it will pass, it will go. It will is an event in our lives. Mm. Uh, the long tail of that will be an issue that we need to think about in the context of what that means in urban policy terms as well as mobility terms. Uh, I, and it's really interesting to hear about John because we are absolutely thinking about what our future functions are, for example, in our town centres. We're commissioning master planning work, which is trying to take some of these ideas and questions through to how we manage urban spaces and places, how we think about their function in the future in the context of that idea of polycentric cities. My own organisation, for example, we, re, we, we are reflecting uh, about the future world of work and thinking about what that future world of work looks like in the context of real estate, for example, that a lot of colleagues will be very interested about. But I think the issue for me is about having that capability and capacity to do that is variable across the country and in London and actually in our sub-region. Uh, and where, going back to the question about where government comes in, it needs to provide the capacity for us to be able to rethink those things, create the spaces for that to happen. Yeah. OK, uh, well, I'd come to Lucette there as well. You're looking across London. Um, do, you, do you see it as a broad concept that can be picked up across London or do you, do we have to really think about uh, and drill down into local areas and their dependencies? Um, it, it's a good question. I think that it's, it's a balance of both, really. I think there are some, you know, there's obviously some overarching global trends that we are seeing around mobility uh, as well as local. But I think we need to see this in the context of not just what people need to move around and how the city is going to potentially reorganize itself. We also have to think, of course, of international visitors, which we currently have very few or none of. But uh, as Niall already said, COVID is an event in our lives and we will kind of come to pass this at some point and hopefully we'll see a resurgence in international tourism and they will be traveling into cities uh, and hopefully in London to, to the extent that they have done before. So there is a wider context of not just the locality and the possible 15 minute city concept, which is very much within the local borough where local authorities will have a more of a role to play in planning for that but also needing to engage with their communities around their needs and around making sure that, you know, the transport is, is right for all the different levels of people that you have within the locality. But I think we have to think beyond that across the city, uh, not just of people traveling in from other parts of the UK, of course, pre COVID the commuter area of London is, is, is massive and stretches way beyond the London boundaries as of course the, the international tourism and setting all of that in the context of, you know, long-term climate change and, and having sustainable transport means that there are definitely uh, some overarching perspectives that I think we need to, to, to look at and consider. Okay, uh, and I wonder, would John or uh, Toby like to pick up on, on that theme um, as well? Uh, you know, the difference to you know, this sort of need for an overriding uh, look at this concept. Uh, yes, sir. Um, I think I, I've tried to define future mobility as that it's it's not just the technology, it's that broader recognition of user-centric commercial viability. Um, but being really centred on the on the biggest pain points that, that as users or as businesses we're facing right now. So if it's about 
maybe getting people back safely into workplaces, uh, thinking through people's anxiety and their needs around deciding to make that journey or not. Um, Pre-COVID, we benefited from the, the journey planners, the the likes of City Mapper, which you know, huge amount of information available to someone making a journey. Uh, previously, that was giving people information where they probably decided on things around efficiency, cost, personalization. I think what we're what we're seeing in terms of priority needs from users now is. Um, how do we how do we provide even more information so that people have flexibility so that people feel like they have choice and they have more information about things that indicate safety or hygiene um, and I think the reaction has been as as John said some of those products that have emerged allowing people to use tech to to book desk space to book to to on the transport side see density of users moving through stations moving through trains but I think that will just um, start to evolve and merge into the mix of mobility as a service as we go through. So I think we can see that if we're focusing on the biggest pain points, there will be a need that can be met by by what future mobility has got to offer. Okay, we've got some good good questions coming in now. I'd, I'd just like to ask one, going to John really there, maybe uh, first, uh, just asking the panel one of interest before I ask a few of these questions as well. Uh, what technologies in particular are going to have a big impact on mobility uh john i don't know what sort of pwc is thinking on this topic uh, but what, what would, would you say are the kind of key technologies i think it's uh, uh, that's a good question it's a fabulous question big questions i'm giving myself uh, sorry advice. about that yeah but, um i think what we're seeing is is a shift from on-premise an ongoing shift to to use of the cloud ongoing use to the the, the adoption of collaborative collaborative working tools um i mean we're 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 a google business um pwc so we're, we're kind of in advance of covid are used to doing a lot of collaboration and working online together we're all using zoom today and we've all finally cracked most of us how to use how to use video conferencing um i think i think that perhaps the more interesting question is there's a, there's a wealth of technology out there but but there's there, there is a limit we do still need the space. There are some things that we simply can't do as well, even if it's coincidental, and this sounds odd, but, but even if it's the enabling of people to, to, to bump into each other and share ideas, whether that's in the firm or outside the firm. And so I think I'd echo some of what Toby says, which is the technology will only get us so far. We're always going to need office space for work, but for us really pertinently, good space in, in good cities or regions for our talent and for our people because our people the people we need to hire do still want that do still want and need that space but i think i'd echo toby's comments on um people need more information and they need to feel there's more flexibility and and and, and choice so there is still this piece leaving aside quite how you get that funded right so incredibly difficult question but there is still that question about well how do we how do we build and make make um our places uh, more appealing to our people and more usable for our people because the draw that you have to be in the office space um, it, it, it is no longer there. And I, I don't think we'll see that return to the way it was prior to COVID. Okay. okay. Would, would anyone else like to sort of point to a particular technology that they think is most important here or that they're looking, looking to on the panel? So uh, I, I I think it's the adapt adaptation, if I may, uh, the adaptation of existing and future technology. I mentioned uh, our, our intention to uh, progress with the Heathrow Active Travel Demonstration, and looking yes. at how we can really use that so that we can capture some of the benefits environmentally that have been evident through the COVID-19 and its long-term sustainability, both financially and in terms of the environmental sense of that. So I think what one of the things we are really interested in looking at, for example, freight and logistics across West London, but specifically in Hounslow, but also in other parts of our sub-region, due to the fact that approximately a fifth of our economy is based on transport and logistics. So part of that GVA I mentioned in my introduction is dependent on that. So the, the trends and shifts that we're seeing at the moment post-COVID, where there's been increases in some of that logistics activity because people are ordering things online, 
uh, means that we have to start thinking about what the environmental, social, and economic costs of that are. And therefore, we're looking at things last, uh, such as aggregation opportunities for freight, looking at last mile delivery, looking at autonomous vehicles potentially within our context. All of those issues need to be embraced and looked at in the context of demonstrating their utility. And I think this is the moment when we can do that. And my call to colleagues who are on this call and beyond is how can we test bed that? How can we look at whether this can really work? Because there's never going to be another opportunity for innovating in this space, such mm -hmm. as we've got at the moment. So uh, whatever that technology looks like, whether it's digital or whether it's physical infrastructure or whether it's adaptive behavioral changes that we need to bring forward, we need to think about how we can demonstrate it and really bring forward those ideas swiftly and quickly. And no doubt Lucette and uh, Toby would want to comment on that as well. The moment is now, really. We've got about uh, six to 12 months in to start really rethinking some of this when there's opportunities, an unfrozen moment, but there's social acceptability around some of this innovation, which we can test bed at the moment. Okay, well, I, I said I'd come to some of the questions from the audience, and there's a, there's a good one here, so I thought I'd pick this one up, and I realise we're racing along already. Um, the question is, for many people, travel is becoming more of a discretionary choice. How can future mobility help to improve the quality of travel experience and the personal choice that's available? And I, I thought, yeah, I'd come to Toby maybe first there to ask about that. I think it's a really interesting question, that. Um, while we're thinking about all of these issues, how do we... How do we improve the quality and choice? Yeah, I, I hope I, I did start to talk to that one earlier, and I yes. think it is it is it is um, recognizing that uh, there perhaps has been a shift in um, in the hierarchy of needs from different users and businesses. So, uh, as I said, I felt it was like a, a move away from where we were. Um, pre-COVID, focusing on what's going to get me there quickest, what's going to get me there cheapest, what's a, a fun and different experience of sharing a journey with different people. Clearly now there's been pressures to push us in the other direction and um, that's led to um, a, a breaking down in people making certain journeys because of these new barriers that are posed. But I think, um, uh, yeah, centering some of the focus on new products, new sets of information that can, uh, you know, guide users on saying, no, actually, I could, I wouldn't have thought to have um, got the train to the station and then walked 25 minutes. But given I've been walking around my neighbourhood for the last six months, uh, that might actually be something as a journey I'm, I'm willing to do. But yeah, I think it's, it's just recognising there's, there needs to be a behavioural science type approach to thinking through mobility. And traditionally in transport, we've just thought about modes and we haven't thought about the people and why they're making different journeys. Okay. Okay. Would anyone else like to pick up on that one? We've got loads of quite, I realize already quarter two and we're running out of time, but uh, yeah, a really interesting topic. Briefly add to that and agree with everything that Toby said. Uh, but to the person who asked the question, I think it's not just about the quality of the journey, but it's about the quality of the space as well, because we have now all realized how nice it is to have nicer streets to walk on and, you know, not, not always be so busy with, with traffic. So, and that's as much about the environment we're in as opposed to just the mode of travel. Um, I think the other thing is around, yeah, the accessibility to information. So the role of data and AI will become increasingly more important to help people make choices, but to also maybe stimulate them to make the right choices. So uh, as Toby already mentioned, it might not just be around how do I get there the quickest and the cheapest, but how might I get there in the most pleasant way? How might I get there in the most sustainable way? And, you know, how do I make a more informed choice and how do I have an integrated journey so that I don't need to think about five different modes of travel and tickets? I mean, we, we have the luxury in London already having a fairly integrated payment system, uh, but still that could go further, particularly as we look to more integration with privately operated modes. So those are my few comments. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask as well, we've heard about it being a great opportunity now to uh, really embrace some of these issues. I mean, it's also an opportunity, I guess, for the UK to really put down a marker as a 
global leader in innovation in some of these areas uh, around sort of future mobility and a you know, great opportunity to create jobs and all the other things that would happen. I mean, is, it, is that happening already or does there, does there does more need to be do, do How positive are people about the UK's position in all of this? Um, I guess I'd like to ask uh, John uh, first about that. Is that fair to keep coming to John first with these type of uh, questions? I don't know. But um, John, what do you think about that, that issue in terms of just harnessing all of this? Hello? Oh, I think we might have... Uh, no, I've returned. I've oh, returned. Pretend. As you can see, you know, the use of technology rather than the location isn't always seamless. Um, I, I, <laughs> I think there's great opportunity for, but for the country, if you like, or for the city. We benefit greatly from that agglomeration effect, high population density, but also early adoption of, of technology. So we kind of have a couple of the foundations, I think, for for, for us to to help set something of an example and to adapt. Um, more readily than more readily than others. Um, okay, internet speeds are always going to are always going to matter. Um, but but it, I, I think my perspective on it would be that that there is there is great opportunity here. But we need but we need to be flexible. I think that the point that, that Lissette and Toby were making about the experience of the user is 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 important. Is something that we're seeing come through not just with reference to what we're talking about today, but more broadly when we think about people as people rather than as, as, as workforce or passenger numbers. And there's, there's definitely, um, I, I think an advantage to be had if we do a better job of thinking about that bottom up perspective of the world, as well as that top down planned mode of transport um, perspective on the world. And there's, there, there's no reason why we can't take a leading edge there. That makes planning difficult, but I think that if there were one theme that emerges, it's it's flexibility and and, and adaptability. Okay. Yes, long term infrastructure, tough, okay. change, but yeah, opportunity. Okay, um, I, I want to ask uh, another quick question, um, and I think this has been touched on particularly by Lucette, so maybe come there first. But how how do we break down barriers to improve access for those with disabilities or on? on low incomes and um yeah there's obviously you 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 were talking about that earlier i think uh, just to ask you what what should, what more can be done uh, yeah it's a very good question because the challenge of course with with a lot of these forms of transport is around the funding models um and at the present moment those are perhaps more impacted than, than anything else we have seen uh because the revenue for for transport for London has of course been significantly impacted. Uh, I'm not sure I have the silver bullet answer uh, for that one, um, but it is, as I mentioned, important that you know accessible public transit and accessible forms of shared mobility will remain a key option. I mean, we, we, we've seen that in, in certain other areas as well. For instance, some of the private sector operators have jumped in with providing transit or repurposing their transit options to, you know, for instance, in the case of key workers, which isn't necessarily vulnerable people, but providing an essential service. And I think it just gives a, a good example of how private sector can firstly uh, respond much quicker to a pandemic and can also, you know, work with public sector in providing some of those services and plugging some of those gaps at critical points in time. And it just goes back to my earlier point that, that public-private dialogue and collaboration is going to be essential. And I think a lot of operators, uh, private sector operators that, you know, would have sort of previously maybe been classed as disruptors, if, if you like, or innovators, depending on how you look at it, uh, have in the past maybe not always collaborated as well with public sector, but I think there's been a key shift in that. And there's been a shift, I think, in attitude from public sector as well, in terms of having those earlier conversations. But I think more more can be done. I mean, we we talk to innovative mobility companies every day. A lot of them are keen to engage more with public sector. And London's particularly challenged with having a fragmented uh, ecosystem on that front. You know, how do they have those early conversations? How do they work with the city and with the local authorities to make sure they put the right types of systems in place? How might they use data to, you know, lower some of those costs that we, for instance, might have around power transit, which we know is essential, but very expensive and often only planned at the borough level as opposed to across multiple boroughs. So I think there's, a, there's quite a few different aspects uh, to that, um, but looking at different ways and, and 
perhaps cheaper ways of planning and, and collaborating to provide those essential services would be, would be critical. Mm. Okay. Um, would anyone else like to pick up on that one? We've got, got about 10 minutes left uh, now. And I was going to come around to all of the um, panellists with a, with a bit of a, uh, a rousing ending question, but uh, I'll, uh, I'll just see if anyone else is keen to pick up on that issue. So I, I, I will if I may, Paul. Um, yeah. This issue about funding and financing uh, a heavy infrastructure is going to be an interesting point that needs to be thought about in terms of government. As this set indicated, a lot of the infrastructure in London is very much dependent on a model which is uh, associated with privatised or quasi-privatised enterprise and there's expectation that they're self-funding. Some of that is predating TfL's um, problems in terms of its financial situation, which is not on its own with every single transport operator in the country has had subsidy as a consequence of pan the pandemic. And that begs the question about who pays and who benefits. So we've got some very ambitious plans for infrastructure improvement, but in initial conversations with some treasury officials, um, I, I won't name them, but I would say what they did say was, why are we thinking about a new infrastructure at the moment when we are transporting air around the country and it's costing £7 billion a year? So the problem for us, therefore, is what do we do in terms of encouraging better mobility whilst also recognising, for a lot of the reasons others have said, that we still require that infrastructure to be invested in. We still require it for the longer term because we will come through this pandemic and it really challenges how things get paid for and who pays and what our model of transport infrastructure investment looks like for the long term. So that is a key question for government and also regional and local authorities and the private sector to rethink those models of investment. So I haven't got the answers to it at the minute. No. Uh, otherwise, I'd be very rich. But actually, we do need to have that debate about how we pay for the infrastructure we need, which is a community asset. Okay. Now, as I say, we're, we're sort of getting close to the, the, the end of our time slot. So I wonder if I go around the, the panel and ask, what do you think will be the biggest cause of change for future mobility? And, yeah, come to Toby first on that. And just, yeah, what, what do you think? The biggest cause of change? Well, I, th I think from, from where we were to where we're, where we're heading now, I hope the shift as a industry in focusing on the user and not just um, paying lip service to that but genuinely embedding that in everything that we do so um, in in co-creation with end users involving them in the uh, in the in the innovation uh, uh, projects in uh, thinking through and making sure that we've validated that everything that we're doing and when we're doing the business cases that we are actually trying to um, measure the benefits that are being brought to users and businesses um, and the problems that they actually face and I think uh, the difference will be where we where we're going is that I think people will recognize that they're not as professionals we have a responsibility to understand the problem at a granular level of detail first um, rather than taking precedent or, or, or looking at what, what you know where we are now is such a complex uh, situation that every project will be unique and, and everything that we do needs to be centered in that place-based solution. Okay um, well I'll move to Lucette now the biggest cause of change for fu future mobility? Uh, yeah, thanks, Paul. I very much agree with what Toby's already said, so I'm not going to, to repeat that. I think I'm going to instead say the biggest driver for change should be uh, us responding to the climate crisis and the need to meet the Paris targets. Uh, whether it's going to be the biggest cause, I don't know, but I think it should be the biggest driver uh, for sure. Uh, and as we know, transport is one of the biggest contributors to emissions, um, so we need to accelerate or focus on that. Um, but otherwise, yes, I do agree with the user centricity as well and the public private collaboration. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Niall. Uh, maybe that should be then the biggest driver of change. What would you, uh, what, what would well, you, 
the well well i think lou said and toby have uh, covered it really uh, i i do think you know there's other imperatives such as lou said's comments about climate change and the climate emergency should be a key driver for us to for push forward in terms of a green recovery and now applies to all sectors of the economy as well as mobility Okay, well, finally coming to um, John, um, it's obviously uh, the, anything else you'd say is going to really be uh, driving change? No, I think, it's, I, th- I think it's the same themes as everybody else has, uh, has already picked up, so I won't wax very off. Yeah, um, no, no one's mentioned COVID-19 as, uh, as particularly there, a key, a key change, but I suppose that's going to have a giant impact as well uh, on, on, on this in a way we weren't expecting, you know, six months ago. I think it's an accelerator. It's accelerated some trends that were there already that we that we that we knew would, would that we knew would emerge and we were perhaps reluctant to tackle. Yeah, okay. Okay, well thank you very much, everyone. That's been uh, been really helpful indeed. I was gonna pass back to um uh, Bonnie now um to uh sort of have a quick look at I think she's gonna you know wrap things up and uh, tell us the answers to the poll. So um passing Back to Bonnie. Thanks, Paul. Um, thank you so much for chairing the session and thank you to our speakers for taking part um, and as well to the combined West London boroughs as part of the Capital West London programme and WSP for bringing this panel together. Um, I think the topic's only going to get more important and it's a really important part of the post-COVID future gazing. So we'll definitely be um, considering this topic more in our future events. Um, just to touch, as Paul mentioned, on the results from the poll, um, the most important factor for this audience was, perhaps unsurprisingly, um, investment in transport infrastructure. Um, but interestingly, uh, net zero and the uh, sustainability agenda did come up um, high as well. So, And that was actually our most popular result in June. So um, again, very topical for this panel. Um, we'll again publish the re- full results at the end of the week. Um, we've got a lot more sessions taking place today. We're in South East England again this afternoon. Um, Again, with an infrastructure focus, if that's your bag. Um, and we're also talking to Jackie Sadek and Peter Bill about their new book, Broken Homes. Um, but if you want to hear more about West London, we've got a great panel on Ealing looking at their culture and creativity um, tomorrow. So all the details for all of those are on the Real Estate Live website. And hopefully we'll see you all at another panel again soon this week. Um, thank you for joining us.